quite some confusion when we talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, for instance, look at this picture already. Is this, why did they choose a jellyfish to represent intelligence? I, mean, I was relieved to, know, to, to, to learn that this was a particularly intelligent jellyfish. But in general, uh, artificial intelligence is creating all sorts of fears in, in people. So uh, current AI, current artificial intelligence, is, is creating all sorts of conversations, all sorts of dialogue on, dialogues between people, from self-driving cars to, for instance, the future of humanity coexisting with intelligent machines. So what do you really feel about it? Do you feel scared? Do you feel worried? Do you feel enthusiastic? Do you feel courageous? In other terms, what comes to your mind when you hear the term artificial intelligence? One thing is actually easy to say. The term artificial intelligence is just a bad choice to describe what is happening today. And I'm sure that Stanley Kubrick would agree with me if I tell you to just forget about Space Odyssey or any other science fiction science fiction movie you might have seen recently about AI, about artificial intelligence. Actually, I should say that a lot of the predictions contained in this movie, Space Odyssey, became true. For instance, the iPad or the labial automatic translation, but not the part concerning intelligence. The word artificial intelligence goes back to the 50s, to the very beginning of computer science and essentially no progress has been made since then. So current AI is not about creating thinking machine, it's about, it's about augmenting our cognitive capability, quite a different matter. So today when we speak, we talk about artificial intelligence, what we really mean is machine learning. And also machine learning is not new. M most of the results go back to 30 or 40 years ago. However, what is new is that in the last decade, machine learning has experienced a spectacular increase in performance, thanks to the combined effect of new computational tools, huge and rich data sets, and new algorithms. It's quite important to observe that once machine learning reaches certain capabilities, reaches the capability of having human accuracy in identifying an object in a picture or any other computational task, then it can do it at a massive scale, and in this sense, become superhuman. So, machine learning is certainly not just one single technique. There are more, many different techniques that are used in, in many different contexts. However, most of the recent progress has been triggered by one such tool that, we, that is called deep learning, and I will discuss this in a minute. But before doing that, I would like to clarify one point. Machine learning is about the capability of extracting information from data. And if you think about it, this is a very important task. It's a kind of a precondition for intelligence. Even before starting to think about creating a human-like thinking machine, you need to be able to create a machine that is capable of giving a meaning to the data it receives, to the input it receives from the external world, and that continuously learns from them. This is totally natural for animals. Thanks to the evolution of their brain and of their visual system, they can instantaneously detect any anomaly, any, uh, the presence of any object in a visual scene. But this has always been very, very difficult for a computer. And let's try, before we uh, enter into discussion of how machine learning works, let's try to write a computer code that you know, performs object recognition, for instance. Suppose you want to write a code that recognizes the presence of a chair in an image. Then what you would need to do is to write a few lines, suppose that you are a software engineer, a few lines of codes which say something like, if the object in the picture has four legs, or if it has a flat surface, and if it has a flat surface to sit on, or if it has a backrest, then this is a chair. And this would perfectly work for the first example of chair in this slide. However, already for the second chair, it's not going to work. 
And the reason is that it doesn't have four legs. So you, have, you would have to go back and modify your code and write a line which says, well, if it has four legs or five wheels, then this is going to be a chair if all the other conditions are met. But again, if you show a chair produced by a designer, then you get completely lost. You don't even know how to encode this. So we need a completely different strategy. We need to learn from examples rather than to define a priori what the objects are. And this is what machine learning is about. Now, once a machine learns to recognize an object, then, at a hum with human accuracy, then it becomes superhuman. In which sense? In the sense that it can do it at a massive scale. So this, let me uh, discuss an example of an application. Suppose you want to do breast cancer screening in your region. And what you would have to do is that each year, you would have to analyze and detect anomalies in millions and millions of mammographic images. And you just don't have enough radiologists for doing that. And I doubt that radiologists would really like to do that as a full-time job. So what you really need is to have a machine that, with human accuracy, is capable of detecting the presence of anomalies. And this is actually doable today. So, the machines that are capable of doing this are machines that learn from previous human information, namely thousands of images that have been studied, annotated, classified by human radiologists, and then building on this information, they become superhuman at analyzing new images. So, as I said, machine learning is a set of tools, and I cannot describe all of them. I'm just going to focus on on the single tool that has triggered most of the interest in, in this last year. And this is called, this technique is called deep learning. Hmm? These are neural networks that perform a particular type of learning. And I will try to discuss this. Uh, a deep neural network is composed of many layers. You have an input layer and an output layer. And then you have many intermediate layers that process the information. So the information enters on the left and goes out on the right. For instance, if you plug in the image of a chair, you want to read out in the output layer an answer which says there is a chair. So the output layer is going to tell you how the network classifies the input. So each network is composed of many layers. Each layer is composed of thousands of nodes that are called artificial neurons. They uh, behave as stylized model of biological neurons. And then the overall network is composed of millions and millions of connections. The connection between neurons can be either weak or strong, depending on how much two connected neurons influence each other. Now, this picture is just like a pinhead in this room. So real deep network have, can have you know, tens of millions of connections. So they are huge, huge objects. So how does learning take place in this uh, kind of systems? Well, learning takes place in, in a ra rather simple uh, manner. You provide a lot of examples to this network of inputs and the corresponding output, and then you progressively and iteratively change all the connection strengths up to the point in which the network is capable of classifying correctly all the examples that you have provided. So you have an iterative process in which you change in an automatic manner millions of connections, presenting millions of examples, and you repeat this operation millions of times. So it's a quite heavy process, and this is why all, all this research activity has been triggered by the possibility of having a, a lot of computational power. Now, once the network has learned to classify all the examples, for instance, examples of faces, then it becomes capable, then you can stop and use it to make predictions. And that point becomes useful. It has learned to classify the, all the examples, and that point you stop and you feed a new image, for instance, that the network has never seen before, and you're going to read the answer. And this is going to be a prediction. And this machine have demonstrated to be particularly uh, efficient in in doing this kind of task. They actually have superhuman performance in the sense that not only they can 
do it at a massive scale, but even the accuracy with which they do it is, is very high. And along the learning process, the various layers specialize in doing different things. The first layers become specialized in extracting all the fundamental features that characterize the input, and the last layer performs the classification. For instance, this image is capable of recognizing a picture of me 25 years ago uh, without have never, having never seen this picture, okay? and, this would, and would be able to do it for, essentially, uh, all of you. Now, uh, there's nothing special about images. Uh, all these techniques can be applied to any uh, field of uh, science, human activities in which data are present and uh, are important. Therefore, uh, this is going to affect our future in a, at 360 degrees. Uh, all our activity in which we need to process information are going to change. We know that jobs are going to change and, and society is going to, ch to change. So it's very important that we understand what we are talking about in this context. In the case of basic science, for instance, you could do nowadays these techniques are used you know, for uh, analyzing data that lead to climate changes. They are need, used to optimize the process of gene editing, a very advanced molecular biology technique. They are used to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the, of the brain, something that we still don't know and it's hopefully going to, to, be, to have a huge impact. And it's even used in astrophysics. So you know, the whole spectrum of uh, of science is, is included. And I'm not mentioning you know, all the uh, application in, in, uh, in, human, uh, in daily human life. This is all fine. However, uh, as performant as all these things may appear, I should say that we are only at a very preliminary stage. There are open problems and challenges ahead of us. For instance, about the functioning of these kinds of devices. We still need to understand how, they, how learning can be made faster, how the prediction performance can be improved, and at a more fundamental level, we need to understand what makes these kind of devices special compared to other type of uh, devices. So where does the propensity to learn and generalize come from? These are mathematical questions that I don't want to address here, but these are open problems on which we all work. Then there are challenges. Let me mention two challenges that are very important. And they're going to you know, give you a clear idea of what could be the impact in the future of this kind of technology. The first challenge is to learn to learn without supervision. So mo the vast majority of the data in the world cannot be annotated, classified by humans. And they contain a lot of information that cannot even be understood by humans. Okay? So we need to develop algorithm that are algorithms that are capable to extract information to identify patterns, to make prediction without human supervision. Okay? So this is you know, a, a challenge, and all the researchers have just, have just started to work on this, are working on this, and it's a totally open challenge. Another critical uh, objective is these kind of networks cannot uh, predict, cannot identify the relationships between causes and effects in data. So somehow this machine has to become capable of identifying causation patterns in, in the data, in the raw data. When this will become possible, then this tool will, will, uh, will provide uh, a lot of information about modeling systems and making very complicated prediction and making you know, new tools available. Uh, as an example of this, I mean, you can use a deep network to recognize images, to, uh, to, for speech recognition, you can use it for playing games, and so on, and you can use it for automatic translation. You can translate from a language to another language that are similar. And this translation is just based on statistics, but you cannot use this kind of tools to create any new type of sentence, because they don't get the logical relationship, say, between words. Okay, just try to set up a conversation between Siri and Google Assistant, and you will see that the conversation becomes totally banal and boring in immediately. As a researcher, however, all these kind of open problems uh, are actually exciting. We don't get depressed when we find open problems. We actually get excited. And, uh, and I think they give a, a, the reason is that they clearly show that there is a huge space for improvement and for, and for application 
uh, across all disciplines. So there are some fundamental challenges that have, you know, there's a huge space for improvement, a lot of space for research, and a lot of consequences ahead of us. So what should a, a student study in order to be prepared to contribute to this field? This is a question that uh, sometimes occurs to my mind, and actually quite often. And well, the answer, in my opinion, is simple. And I have to say that a lot of colleagues of mine agree on this. There's no shortcut. Students need to know the fundamentals. They need to know math. They need to know physics. They need to know computer science. They need to know biology. They need to know chemistry. They need to know economics. They need to have all the methodological tools that allow them to analyze complex systems. They need to have this background. This is the only way they can actually use the cognitive power provided by these new tools. So the message for students is actually do not specialize too soon. You have to become strong from a methodological point of view, be able to model complex systems, understand all the tools, and then use this tool or even advance this tool. So I hope that this discussion has somehow clarified which is the current state of the art in artificial intelligence. The present of artificial intelligence is not about thinking machine. Machines is about augmenting our cognitive capabilities through these tools that are already at work and that have an immense possibility of making further progress. So as a researcher, I would really like to sit on the other side of the stage together with the students. And the reason is that there are fantastic and broad challenges ahead of us, and therefore, this is a truly remarkable time to be a student. Thank you.